I'm going to change direction a little bit. This is going to be primarily a clinical lecture because my colleagues, I really uh, relegated the task of the basic science to them. I really didn't want to talk about that. I wanted to talk more about the clinical pathologic correlation. I was asked to give this lecture in London, and the issue here is when, when we make the diagnosis of melanoma, can that diagnosis result in a problem or an error? In other words, these are the cases in which all pathologists and all dermatologists very much fear. It's that time when you get a slide request, a chart request, when you know something went wrong. And so what I did is I looked at five different patterns of histology, and this, the clinical in these is very important as well, and I categorized it into four, five groups, and I even have six if I can go to the sixth, where I thought something could go wrong. And I think that these particular variants are very important for the pathologist as well as the dermatologist to know so that these errors are not continued in the future. So here's group one. This is what I call the deceptive spindle cell lesion group. These lesions can look like a scar, a schwannoma, or a neurofibroma, a myxoma, even a dermatofibroma. This is what it looks like clinically. This is just a standard example, but it can actually much be much more deceptive than this. Here we see this patient, sun-exposed skin, obviously some coarse wrinkling, and on his cheek, there's an elevated nodule with a slight macular hyperpigmentation. Looking at this, it doesn't really look very worrisome, and you may be inclined just to follow the patient or not to do anything. Here's the histology in this patient. This is actually not the same patient, but what it would look like, and I want you to look at the different areas, and we'll go over them one by one. See the arrow on top? See the second arrow? And see the S on the bottom? I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, what do you know? Pointer. Okay, there we are. Okay. This, this, and this. Okay, each one of those is important in establishing the diagnosis. In the dermis, there's this fascicular spindle cell proliferation. And within this one lesion, there are actually many different patterns. Here we see one area, and mind you, this is just one tumor. One area of the tumor looks like a dermatofibroma. Cells interposed between collagen bundles. Another area, this looks a little bit more malignant, but you could say that this looks like a fibrosarcoma. Spindle cells in parallel. Here, they're interspersed. There's only a little bit of atypia, but they're separated by a mucinous material. This looks like a myxoma. Another area of the cells are very wavy, and the collagen is very wavy. This looks like a neurofibroma or a schwannoma. Now, you'd be very inclined to say that this doesn't look so bad, but then you look at a telltale clue. You look at the epidermis overlying it, and there's solitary melanocytes proliferating, and those melanocytes predominate. Not much atypia, just like an atypical antigenous proliferation. Also, in another area of the slide, there's these characteristic lymphoid aggregates. And these lymphoid aggregates probably represent type of immune response to this tumor. We all know what this is. This is a desmoplastic neurotropic melanoma. Now, I went to a course at Harvard around 15 years ago, and this guy, Phil McKee, does anybody know him? Philip McKee, okay. He said, and I believe, that every time when you sign out a case, you should think, breathe, eat, whatever, the diagnosis of desmoplastic melanoma, because it is so frequently missed. Anything that is a little bit off base, uh, you should consider this diagnosis, because both clinically and pathologically, it is missed many times. And it is often only diagnosed in the later stages of disease. This is a spindle cell proliferation that can, as I mentioned, can have almost any histology. It can look like a scar, it can look like a neurofibroma, it can look like a dermatofibroma, and often it has no pigment, no discerning histologic or even sometimes clinical features by which you can make the diagnosis. The spindle cells can look like anything. They can look like myofibroblasts, fibroblasts, swan cells. It is often misdiagnosed. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen this not diagnosed correctly and only discovered at a later stage. Um, there was this one pathologist I knew that ordered S100 stains on everything. 
And I realized that probably the reason he did that, he missed the desmoplastic melanoma, because that is the stain that you use. Fortunately, in some, and now the extent of this varies according to the study you look at. It can be from a few percent to as high as 80%, but approximately two thirds have something in the epidermis which gives the clue that, in fact, this is a melanoma. The remainder, there's no overlying proliferation. So that's sort of like a de novo dermal type. Perhaps the melanocytes were deeper in the dermis. The lymphoid aggregates, if you see that, that's very characteristic. And you should look for that in those cases without the atypical hyperplasia. Always think of DMM if the diagnosis is a scar. Ancillary histopathologic clues may not be present. So you may not always see the atypical hyperplasia. And you may not see the lymphoid aggregates. You must always think of this, OK? Because what can happen is, what is it allowed to grow as what you think is a scar? You'll find three years later, it's a massive, you know, several centimeter deeply invasive nodule. Now, fortunately, immunohistochemical stains usually establish a diagnosis. The one that is usually used is the S100 protein. But as you know, S100 is very sensitive, but not very specific. And that's the standard for the diagnosis. But there are two others that can be used, the SOX10 and the nerve growth factor P75 can be used. And those are helpful, but many people don't have the other two antibodies. But in those rare cases that are S100 negative, you can actually use those antibodies. All the other markers are negative, and the melanocyte markers are negative in the spindle cell areas. So here's the S100 stain. OK, here you can see cytoplasmic and nuclear staining. Group two, hypopigmented lesion. You may see in the biopsy only scarring, post-inflammatory change, meaning melanin in the dermis, or an inflammatory infiltrate. OK, here's just an example of what this could look like. Here's a patient. This is not the patient I'm going to be showing you. I'm going to show you another patient. But Notice that in this patient, there's massive sun damage here. It's clear there's hyper and hypopigmentation. This is a patient that's been you know, having a lot of exposure. And you see one area in the back. Notice that there's whitening. There's what looks like something that's flesh colored here. And there's what looks like a little bit of dermal melanosis. So notice that was circled for a reason. Well, let me tell you about a case that really happened at Mount Sinai. We had a 53-year-old male with a Here's several month history of a variably pigmented skin lesion. Here's all it shows. There's a, a row of melanophages. There's a little bit of this coarse fibrosis in the dermis, and there are prominent vessels. There's not much at the DE junction. Again, uh, another view showing this coarse collagen and variable pigment in the dermis. OK, does anybody want to tell me what this is? Correct. Here is the melan A stain. And there was absolutely nothing there. And this is very strange, because with the melan A stain, there should be melanocytes, you know, 1 to 4 to 1 to 10 keratinocytes. That's the average amount. Notice you only find two or three here. OK? So this is complete regression of a primary melanoma. Now, why is this important? Now, I know one of the things the residents learn every year is they talk about regression. But we're talking about a different animal here entirely. We're talking about regression that is very extensive. Because my feeling is regression represents an attempt to contain the tumor, and that it contains it for a while. And then in some patients, it stopped, and some there's an escape for whatever reason, change antigens, molecular mechanisms that we're not aware of. But this is something in which there's really very substantial regression. And there is good evidence, much of an anecdotal, but some we actually published in which, when this occurs, it has a very adverse outcome. How do we define this? So in our, when we um, uh, describe this entity, and this is well known, we s had certain criteria for the diagnosis. It had to be a broad band of fibrosis. There had to be no evidence of melanocytic lesion by H&E and by step sectioning of those. Because as you're well aware, when you have a very large biopsy, if you don't step section it, there could be another area with melanoma there. You do um, immunohistochemistry, and the melanocytic markers are negative. But of course, CD68, which is his histiocytic marker, would be positive. 
Now, the problem is, is once you make that diagnosis of a completely gross melanocytic lesion, they always say it can be close to impossible to distinguish from a regress, let's say, halo nevus, a regress lichenoid keratosis, or something, or something else. I actually think it's not difficult in most cases. I think there are times in which you have to recognize your limitations. But I think you can suggest that, in fact, it may be a breast melanoma. If you see very abundant melanin, something called tumoral melanosis, sheets of melanophages just coursing through the dermis and nothing else, that is almost always a regressed melanoma. OK, so this is what happened in that patient. I said I thought it was regressed lesion. And the surgeon who did the initial biopsy said, no, it's not. But several months later, the patient presented with a huge dermal nodule. The dermal nodule is composed of atypical epithelioid cells and spindle cells in a, a fascicular and alveolar pattern. And also, the patient at the same time had a bone marrow aspirate. And the bone marrow aspirate showed these atypical epithelioid-like cells as well. What did the patient have? Well, 13.5 millimeter thickness dermal metastasis and lytic bone metastases. OK, what is the significance of this? It can be occur, usually when this complete regression and this distance spread that occurs as a consequence, it is sometime in con continuity close to when this is discovered. But the unfortunate thing is, what you want to be is proactive with these. You don't want to find the metastasis and then come back and say, let's search the patient for evidence of hypopigmentation. I'm sure this has happened to every single dermatologist here. You find that we've been talking many times at this meeting about metastasis with an unknown primary. It's interesting that some of those may be clear cell sarcoma. But more often than not, what they are going to request you to do and I'm sure all the derm residents here and all the dermatologists have had to do it. They say, search this patient for a hyper or hypopigmented lesion. Search the patient for a mucosal melanoma. Search the patient for a GI primary. You want to make the diagnosis of regression at the time it occurs, not when the spread occurs. And fortunately, in all of the cases that we had that I'm aware of, there could be ones I'm not aware of, we made the diagnosis of regression and it's better to do that to avoid a medical legal situation because uh, this is a real pitfall because what can happen in these patients, and we actually had a case in which the patient developed metastases and they requested every single pigmented lesion that she had biopsied reviewed. And everything was benign except one which showed a dermal infiltrate, fibrosis, and melanophages. And the presumption is that was the regress lesion. So what would I recommend in this? If you see a lesion which you think is a regress melanocytic lesion, you make that diagnosis. If it meets any of the criteria that I just mentioned, being broad, having a coarse fibrosis, suggest in the diagnosis that it could be a regress melanoma. If you see that, then I would also recommend that you tell the clinician to re-excise it. And why is that? Because even though you don't see anything, it doesn't mean it's not there. And I know that sounds crazy, but I think it is probably more prudent that considering that you can have subclinical extension, you don't know somewhere outside of that area that you're looking, there are an atypical melanocytes. So I would strongly recommend the lesion be re-excised. Re and this has happened to us several times. It's happened to us three times we had a completely regressed melanoma. All three times, I think we made the diagnosis correctly, but one case ended up as a malpractice suit. And it was not, we were not sued, though. One of the clinicians was. So it's something to strongly consider if you see this. Group three. OK. Hyperpigmentation on sun-exposed skin. This can be a real problem. Subclinical extension of melanocytes. And this is something you see primarily in the lentigo malignant type of melanoma. You are aware that the definitions of what constitutes an adequate margin in melanoma are rather elastic. They have changed over the years. And now there are recommendations that melanoma margins may have to be more than 5 millimeters if they're in situ. And that's primarily because of these studies that some most surgeons have done with subclinical extension on sun-exposed skin, particularly facial skin. So here's a patient I actually saw. And this, I remember this patient quite well. He came into my office. He had pigmentation of his eye. 
Okay, you can see that uh, it's extending, um, you know, to the lid margins. And I asked him to open his eye. He has extension onto the scleral conjunctiva, the conjunctiva itself, and he's really going to the limbus. Okay, this is what happened in this patient. This is something called conjunctival melanosis. Are, is anybody familiar with that term? Okay, what does conjunctival melanosis mean? It is the ophthalmologist term for melanoma in situ of the conjunctiva or eyelid, or uh, it's eyelid conjunctiva or sclera or whatever, scleral conjunctiva. It should be called melanoma in situ, but that's the term that they use. This patient had a diagnosis. I was asked to review the, see the patient and review the slides. This patient, I looked at the slides, and it looked like so-called conjunctival melanosis, but there was very scant superficial invasion, maybe, you know, like I would say 0.1 millimeter if you had to measure it. Well, how do ophthalmologists treat this conjunctival melanosis? Does anybody know? Well, that's one of them. That's correct. But you know how they treat it before they treat it with a nucleation? Topical therapy. They use liquid nitrogen or mitomycin C. This patient said that he had been treated with liquid nitrogen twice. And so he asked me what, my, what I thought should happen. Should he have liquid nitrogen done a third time? And the ophthalmologist said, if that's done, he's sure to go blind. Or should he have the lesion enucleated? And he said, what are you going to advise me to do? What do you think I told him? Uh, I actually didn't say anything. I was flabbergasted. I just went like this. I was surprised he was even asking me that question. But, but anyway, <laughs> so sorry. I don't always have the answer. OK, difficult moral question. So here's the pathology. Here you see in the mucosal epithelium melanocytes at all levels of the epithelium. That's clearly atypical. They're extending down the mucosal glands. And although I don't have any to show you, there were rare melanocytes that clearly showed invasion, but very superficial invasion. It also extended to the skin. You can see solitary melanocytes predominate over nests. So there's melanoma in situ everywhere. Now, the issue in this patient was this lentigo maligna that extended onto the conjunctiva, which can happen, or was it conjunctival melanosis spreading onto the skin? I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, you know, that's a more academic point. But there have been cases, for example, of lentigo maligna. You actually look in the literature where it, for example, occurs on the cheek, and it actually extends it to around the other side into the mucosal surface. So there can be subclinical extension that is very extensive. So what happened to this patient? He then, on his own, had an enucleation performed. That's what he decided to do. OK, a few months, well, it's probably more than that. I think it was more than a year later. Nasal mucosa was biopsy because he had a little bit of epistaxis. In his nasal mucosa, he had isolated in situ atypical melanocytes. Here they are, melanastane. You can see they're all levels of epithelium. In his nasal mucosa, not in his eye, he developed invasive disease. He was put on ipilimumab. He developed metastatic disease. My question next to you is, how did it get there? Can anybody give an answer to me? Lymphatic invasion, anybody have any other ideas? Correct, the nasolacrimal duct by in situ spread is what the hypothesized mechanism is. It's only been reported a few times in the literature. So this patient went through the problem of having an enucleation, which is obviously quite a dilemma, you know, to have to, you know, it's really, it's a moral problem. I mean, that's why I couldn't answer his, his question. And um, he still developed metastatic disease. So this brings up the issue is, what is the adequate margin for melanoma? And again, I don't really have an answer for you, but I can tell you that in the lentigo maligna type, this happens all the time with all the surgeons here and the dermatologists. Sometimes we don't know what the real margin is. We don't have, in, now in, if we get in situ fish or something like that, or we can do molecular assays on sun-exposed skin and determine whether those single melanocytes are in fact melanoma in situ or photoactivation then we will be able to make an appropriate diagnosis. But until then, there are many cases in which 
there is subclinical extension of a massive amount that we are not even recognizing. And this was an unfortunate case where that happens. Okay, we all know this one, and this is just something that you know we all keep on talking about, and uh, Nina's gonna be talking a little bit more about how we're gonna uh, really make uh, more accurate diagnoses through molecular technology now. So um, we know all what a typical Spitz nevus is, and a typical Spitz nevus, and you know, I hate terms like typical and atypical Spitz nevus because Spitz nevi are typically atypical. So, you know, I don't know, but there's something called an atypical Spitz nevus. So then is it atypically atypical? I, I don't know. Is that a double negative anyway? I don't know. But anyway, so here you can see a typical Spitz nevus, which I actually don't find that difficult to diagnose. You can see there's a primarily nested melanocytic proliferation, you know, the banana-like sheets of melanocytes, the clefts, the transepidermal uh, elimination, the sharp lateral demarcation, uh, the uh, uniform cytology, the acanthosis of the epidermis. This is, and you know, the cells are large, they're atypical, but it's still a spitz nevus, or also called a nevus of large spindle and or epithelioid cells, okay? And named after Sophie Spitz. I think she was at Memorial, by the way, so yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, anyway, um, the problem about spitz nevi, even when they're not atypical, it is quite clear that by histology, they have more things in common with melanoma than they do have differences. And this is the thing I always teach the residents, don't be alarmed because these are difficult. And believe me, every one of us, or maybe I'm only speaking for myself, every time you look at one of these under the microscope, you get a little bit nervous, you know, a little bit of palpitations and so forth. Well, anyway, so this is what your standard Spitz nevus looks like. It's circumscribed. It's uh, you know, I'll talk about this later, limited pagetoid extension, limited mitotic nested, and small. But then every once in a while you get a lesion that is a little bit, now clinically this looks atypical, it's like a pseudopod. And you look at this and it does have spindle cells, but notice it's a little bit more cellular than your typical spitz <laughs> I'm doing it again, I'm sorry, okay. There's even something that looks like a Camino body, right? That's diagnostic of benignancy, isn't it? And notice in this that there are numerous mitotic figures. Now, one of the things, just by routine histology, that is disturbing in any melanocytic lesion is if you have any mitotic activity whatsoever, it is bad. And it's particularly bad if it's in certain locations within the biopsy. So what is the so-called atypical Spitz tumor? It shows some of the features of Spitz nevus, but it's usually larger, more cellular, can be ulcerated, and mitotically active, and particularly if they're at the base of the lesion, you should be very concerned. So what do you do in these cases? Do not hesitate to use this term. And I don't care if the patient's one year old. You know, say, well, it's a child. Well, too bad. I mean, it really does result in a problem, because as you can imagine, when somebody's five years old and you make a diagnosis of an atypical melanocytic lesion, what the outcome is going to be. The slide gets sent everywhere. This happens, it actually happens pretty often on our service because you do have these atypical pigmented lesions in children. You must recommend re-excision in difficult cases. Don't hesitate. It doesn't matter how old the patient is. Now, there are cases, of course, we have to be more sensitive. It's on facial skin. And we'll talk about the technology we can use in order to make those difficult decisions. Send to an expert if necessary. Any, and we send them out ourselves sometimes to other people with, who have expertise in the diagnosis of pigmented lesions. We all say the same thing, by the way, when we do send them out. Everybody hedges a little bit, you know, say, well, whatever. Anyway, the molecular techniques uh, we will be talking about, uh, and Nina will be talking about, and Raj will mention it a little bit. And now they're finding out that it's not as easy as benign and malignant. And uh, one of the Durham residents and I are actually uh, studying this now and they're probably subsets of disease. So those that are atypical and don't follow the usual pattern, there's probably more than one type. And we have group five, and this is particularly the worst one, and I'll finish with this one. Uniform population of melanocytes without atypia. Believe it or not, you can have something that the patient presents and it looks like banal intradermal nevus. Now, I'm not saying you should go crazy every time you see one. 
But for example, in the papomas and some of these new syndromes, they're saying the nevi actually look quite benign clinically. Clinically. Okay, and this is what this patient had a lesion on the ear. The patient was in their 50s. And at low power, this looks like it has an alveolar pattern. But I want to point out one thing, and it's the one thing that fortunately, when we looked at this slide, that made us realize that it was unusual. There's a little nest there. And on facial skin, nevi mature very quickly. They become intradermal by the time you're around 20 or even earlier. So the finding of a junctional, neva, junctional focus in an otherwise melanocytic nevus is a cause of concern. Look at these cells. They're in an alveolar arrangement like a nevus, but there's this nest in the D junction, which is very troubling. Notice that they're a little bit hyperchromatic, and they're both spindle and epithelioid. And when you see that pattern, both spindle cells and epithelioid cells in a nevus, it may should make you think perhaps it's not a nevus. OK, notice it's not maturing with descent. And the cells are a little bit hyperchromatic. So this is something called a nevoid, minimal deviation, pseudoverucoid melanoma. It has many different names. But the concept is it's one in which the histology so little deviates from an ordinary nevus that it can be almost impossible to diagnose. And this is the one that now I think people, the pathologists, and probably the clinicians as well are missing. And I would say it's probably a major cause of litigation, in addition to desmoplastic melanomas and some of these other ones. You look for the older age, and what do you look for? You see sheets of melanocytes that don't mature. You see a little bit of cellularity, and they can be both monomorphism and pleomorphism. So in other words, if you don't see those so-called theeks, and you just see sheets of melanocytes, you really have to consider this entity. There can be an absent epidermal component, so it can be just a dermal neoplasm. But in this case, the epidermal component helped. Striking resemblance to ordinary nevi. Here is my advice. If you see a nevus and it doesn't show theeks, and it just shows sheets of melanocytes, and the cells all look the same, give it that second look. Don't do that you know, one second, next slide type of thing. Look for those mitotic figures. So what are the things, this is very hard to diagnose, and I can't tell you, it's been missed so many times. And you always hear about cases when a melanocytic lesion is uh, missed. I, you know, I don't know if any of you know that, because you, know, you just hear about it. You know, it comes to the tertiary medical centers. You look for the presence of mitoses, particularly at the base, and in lesions that should be purely intradermal, if you say, see evidence of cells in the epidermis, when the nevi should be completely mature by that time, then you should suspect that diagnosis. Also, immunohistochemical studies do help. The uh, S phase marker, KI67, a proliferative marker, is increased. And particularly, look at the base. And the HMB45, which usually has a pattern where there's more staining on top and less on the bottom, sometimes will show a diffuse pattern. But the, even these are not reliable, particularly the HMB45 because you can have what they call an invasive melanoma with paradoxical maturation in which the cells get smaller and it really looks like a nevus for all practical purposes. Here's the KI-67. There was extensive staining at the base in this lesion. So it should be viewed primarily as melanomas which mimic a nevus histology and difficult to diagnose. But unfortunately, the real meaning of this term is many times these lesions are diagnosed only in retrospect when a metastasis has occurred and obviously none of us want this to occur. Uh, thank you very much.